Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this session, I'm going to talk about the imperial Gothic and the characteristics of such a narrative before moving on to the second section of Rudyard Kipling's My Own True Ghost Story. So uh, ideally, um, the point is to try and look at Kipling's story through the principles of the imperial Gothic narrative. Now, I want to first uh, talk about the other in the 19th century, the figure of the other. Um, so, how did um, the 19th century British society looked at the foreign or the other? The other is another word for the foreign, something that is not home, which usually means Great Britain. So, the other in the 19th century fiction uh, in the British context uh, is usually associated with mysticism, something that is uh, mysterious as well as spiritual, something that we cannot understand quite easily. Uh, it is also problematically associated with degeneracy, uh, something that is not uh, morally acceptable, morally right. So, degeneracy is, uh, is, is associated with uh, uh, something that is uh, backward in terms of morality, lifestyle and other associated things. The other, the figure of the other is also uh, linked to irrationality, unreason, someone who is not enlightened, someone who is barbaric. So, these are also the characteristics which are given, which are uh, used to describe the figure of the other in 19th century fiction. Uh, I am talking about these um, ideas because they are going to be also uh, employed to talk about uh, the gothic figures in imperial locales. So, uh, let us see what they are. The imperial gothic is a mode that was in a fashion in the late 19th century fiction and as I just pointed out, the imperial gothic draws on uh, gothic motives. Um, so, it kind of sources some of the characteristics uh, for its figures and setting from gothic fiction. So, what are they? The imperial gothic has a bleak and threatening atmosphere, something that is gloomy, something that is uh, scary frightening, hostile and as you would know by now, uh, these uh, characteristics are also found in the gothic uh, narrative. So, imperial gothic and the classic gothic kind of overlaps uh, in terms of the usage of similar pointers to talk about settings and figures. The imperial gothic also has evil oppressive male figures, uh, patriarchal figures if I want to be uh, very, uh, very, very specific and sometimes uh, these imperial gothic uh, would be associated with a native nobleman quote unquote. So, um, you know according to the setting, the oppressive male figures are uh, tweaked uh, in such fiction. So, you can see where the imperial gothic narratives draw on to uh, populate and reconstruct the, their own narrative worlds. Further, uh, the gothic motives in imperial uh, gothic narratives also uh, include brutal violence and crime. So, there is a lot of uh, murders and other assaults that are uh, carried out in imperial gothic fiction. And again, uh, the classic gothic cue of um, an obsession or a preoccupation with the occult and the supernatural is also present in imperial gothic fiction. Now, Edward Said's Orientalism published in 1978 is a landmark publication in this context. Uh, he is the one who kind of uh, formalized um, 
the, the category of the Orient as was understood by the Western uh, nation. So, uh, he wrote that in the 18th and 19th century, European scholars uh, described the Orient, the East as um, uh, in strong opposition or contradiction to the West, which is uh, known as the Occident. So, the Orient is always understood in contrast to the Occident, the Western uh, domain and the Orient meant mysterious, barbaric, irrational, seductive and dangerous. Um, so, these uh, certain terminology are especially uh, interesting in relation to uh, Rudyard Kipling's uh, My Own True Ghost Story because uh, if you look at some of the uh, ghosts, the Indian ghosts that appear in this particular uh, short story, you would remember that the female ghosts uh, of dead uh, women, women who die in childbirth are seductive and dangerous too. So, you can easily apply the principles of orientalism uh, as understood by the western uh, scholars of these uh, periods 18th and 19th century uh, and, uh, and, and apply them to uh, some of the works uh, that were produced during the uh, late 19th century in the context of uh, the imperial gothic. I have some examples of such works um, which can be categorized as Victorian Imperial Gothic and they are Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mines published in 1885, She 1887 and these works were set in Africa. So, um, the dark continent is also uh, considered or, or lumped with this uh, category uh, of the imperial uh, gothic because of the forces of imperialism and sometimes when we talk about the orient all these um, non-western countries are also somehow uh, considered together because uh, the uh, the cues the figurative um, manner in which some of the uh, ideas of the uh, african continent are also discussed is similar to what we see in eastern fiction now, uh, Rudyard Kipling's story, The Phantom Rickshaw, uh, is set in British India and that is also an example of the Imperial Gothic. Richard Marsh, The Beetle, was set in Egypt and London. So, you can see all these uh, locations, Egypt, India and Africa, uh, these are all uh, colonies um, of the empire, the British Empire and therefore, all these colonies, the Orient as well as the um, other the spots which have been colonized by the imperial uh, uh, govern government of uh, Britain kind of share similar characteristics in terms of the antagonists and in terms of the setting and some of the subject matter that are explored in such fiction. Now, uh, the Arabian Nights is a landmark uh, work in terms of um, structuring and solidifying the idea of the Orient for the British reader. So, I have here the title page of the Arabian Nights uh, uh, here on the slide for you and this uh, work has become a trendsetter for other tales about the Orient and, and these tales were in great demand uh, in the British uh, market. So, the Arabian Nights was published early in the 18th century and it was massively successful with the British reading public who just consumed this work avidly and um, the Arabian Nights as I just pointed out uh, create a, created a, a big demand for oriental tales in prose and verse and authors began to uh, you know uh, hunt for such stories uh, from all these dark spaces uh, quote unquote in order to entertain the uh, English uh, reading public, the reading public uh, in the West. So, what about uh, the subject matter of these stories? What did they uh, talk about? They consisted of tyrants, harems, 
the the uh, you know the set of women that these tyrants had uh, for their pleasure dungeons abductions betrayals and mysticism um, and, and mysticism as I said as I pointed out is something to do with spirituality as well as uh, the occult and and, and magic as well uh, so all these um, ideas uh, were uh, explored in these uh, oriental tales or presented in these oriental tales for the benefit of these uh, um, uh, English uh, or British reading public, the Western public, who were uh, awestruck by the exotic nature of these worlds, um, these oriental worlds or colonial worlds. Now, I want to come back to the presence of the imperial within Great Britain. So, uh, in terms of the literary uh, context and the best example, an example that I have been using uh, consistently for this course is uh, Jane Eyre and Jane Eyre has associations with imperial gothic uh, uh, narratives uh, and I will tell you uh, what they are. Uh, if you remember Bertha, she is the uh, mad wife of Rochester, the protagonist of this uh, novel and she is insane, um, quote unquote, and she is kind of um, locked up in an attic um, like setting uh, in this mansion, big mansion, gothic mansion, Thorn, uh, uh, Thornfield and she is uh, quite interesting in the context of the imperial gothic and if you remember I did mention that uh, Bertha haunts this uh, mansion at night uh, when everybody is asleep and she also has a, a fight at one point in the story with uh, Rochester. So she has imperial gothic associations which I will discuss uh, now. So the mad Bertha is Jamaican in origin. So, it is a colony, it is a British colony and Jamaica is a planter society and um, planter society depended on the slave labor of the natives. So, uh, we have this origin for this mad Bertha who is um, the wife of the hidden wife. Nobody knows that um, Georgester's wife is um, uh, upstairs locked up. So, she is the hidden wife of this hero and she is uh, referred to as, as the dark beauty. She is beautiful but dark. So, there is a suggestion from critics such as uh, Suzanne Daly that there is a racial mixing to her uh, uh, origins perhaps and um, again this connects her to this idea of the imperial gothic in a uh, British setting. And there is another imperial gothic association in this particular novel and that is through Jane's cousin, Jane A's cousin St. John Rivers who is a missionary, missionary and who is going to embark uh, on a journey to India in order to uh, spread the word of God and bring enlightenment to this um, dark country. So, St. John Rivers also connects this um, country of Britain with India. So, you can see how um, you know the uh, colony is kind of coming back to uh, the metropolis, uh, coming back to uh, uh, London and Great Britain and somehow disturb the equanimity, disturb the stability of the home and that seems to be one of the functions of uh, colonial uh, people and objects in British fiction. There are further imperial gothic associations in Jane Eyre and that is uh, in the inheritance, the money that Jane receives from Mr. Eyre and uncle who dies uh, leaving his entire wealth to Jane Eyre and this uncle is a wine merchant in Madeira which is again a, a, a colony which uh, makes its wealth through slave labor. So, this wealth also has colonial, colonial associations and um, so, when we think about all this, uh, we also realize that St. John Rivers is kind of uh, sent off to India without um, getting married to uh, Jane Eyre. So, he is unsuccessful there and Bertha, 
the mat, but uh, sets fire to uh, Thornfield Hall, and um, you know, and she is killed in the fire too. Um, so she is killed off. So that foreign association is also eliminated. Um, the, the association that Bertha had is is also kind of wiped out, uh, along with uh, Bertha herself. So that's gone, and and Mr. Eyre also dies off, and St. John Rivers just vanishes out of um, Great Britain. So all these uh, men and women. Uh, who have foreign associations are gradually removed from the space, uh, the narrative space, uh, which, uh, which is kind of occupied and dominated by um, British uh, figures. So, uh, British Empire is uh, understood as a place of fortunes, as you can see in Madeira, where uh, from where Jane gets her wealth and inheritance. Uh, so it is a place of fortune. It is where people make a lot of money. It is uh, a place where people rise from lower positions to higher uh, positions. But it also uh, poses a grave risk to British bodies, minds and souls. So it is um, posing a lot of threat, um, spiritual threat as well as physical threat to British figures. So that has to be uh, kept in mind. So it is perhaps a trade off um, that these figures uh, have for the uh, amount of money that is kind of pumped up, uh, pumped into the uh, country. Now, uh, I want to further talk about uh, the people and objects of imperial origins. I did mention how they affect uh, uh, the stability in terms of Jane Eyre, uh, but uh, affecting um, the happiness of Rochester and Jane is one good example. Uh, the other uh, can be uh, discussed in the context of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, which was published in 1868. So, um, Bertha, as I pointed out, burns down Thornfield. But in the case of Wilkie Collins, we have not a female figure, uh, a racially mixed figure. We don't have that in the Moonstone. Instead, what we have is a diamond, a diamond which creates havoc in the uh, novel. So, uh, a very young woman, a young woman gets a diamond as a birthday gift from her uncle and as, as soon as she gets the diamond, her mother dies, she breaks off her engagement with her uh, uh, lover and the entire house has to be vacated. So, uh, you can see the, this, the kind of uh, storm um, that this Indian diamond uh, brings to this English home. And what is further interesting uh, about the diamond is the fact that it has been stolen by an English man. It has been stolen and offered as a gift. So, uh, and it's stolen from a temple. So we have a Brahmin priest trying to retrieve um, this diamond from England. So they travel all the way uh, from India to Britain to get hold of the diamond and take it back to the temple. So all these are, um, you know, uh, the plot elements which uh, creates a lot of drama and, uh, uh, and, and interest in this particular novel. What is uh, significant about uh, the Indian priests uh, in this uh, novel Moonstone is the fact that uh, they are portrayed as dangerous mysterious and superstitious. So, all these elements are uh, characteristics of the oriental figures. So, uh, and these figures are um, seen as a threat to the happiness of this um, central female character Rachel Verinder uh, in this particular novel. Uh, and and, and that is also complicating the plot. Further, Wilkie Collins does something very important in this uh, fiction, which is portray the English as greedy. We have to uh, remember, and it is constantly pointed out, that the English people have stolen the diamond from India and they have uh, therefore brought the wrath of uh, the Brahmin uh, priests um, and the Orient uh, on themselves. So, um, you can also, uh, you know, uh, understand that point uh, and, and not uh, 
perceive that uh, Wilkie Collins is kind of blindly attacking the Orient. He further introduces a character called uh, Mr. Jennings and Mr. Jennings is a physician and he is a man who has ha who is half English and half in, uh, Eastern and he is the one who solves the mystery that part is hidden here it, I have written solves the mystery um, of this particular uh, complication in the novel but uh, eventually Mr. Jennings also dies in the novel and he does not have an heir he does not have a progeny. So, you can see his line being cut off uh, and, and eventually uh, the uh, novel tells us that the Brahmin priests do get the moonstone, the diamond and take it back home successfully. So, while the greed of the English, the rapacity of the English is uh, asserted and reinforced, we also realize that things and objects and people associated with the foreign or the orient uh, or with the empire is also removed from the landscape of uh, Great Britain. Now, I want to talk uh, about Dracula which was published uh, in 1897 and understand the characteristics of the central figure, the vampire. And if you uh, read the novel, you will understand that uh, uh, Stoker's vampire has foreign origins and, um, and that foreign origin in itself seems to already always implicate the central figure as evil. And uh, further, this vampire turns the English into vampires. It kind of drains the blood of the English figures and turns them into this monstrous creature. So, there is an implication that uh, there is uh, deracination going on. The ethnicity is kind of wiped out along with the draining of the blood. So, that is seen as a big threat and Dracula is also racially impure. Why? Because it feeds on the blood of all sorts of people. So, you can see that contamination, you can see that um, you know impurity of blood being symbolically and uh, literally um, sketched out in the character of this vampire. And of course, the foreign is gothic in such works. So, the foreign is um, not only gothic, the foreign is a threat, the foreign is dangerous, the foreign is impure, uh, the foreign is also a highly, uh, you know, a hostile, uh, hostile to the uh, health and happiness of the uh, home, which, uh, which is usually uh, Great Britain or London or England. Now, uh, late Victorian imperial Gothic was worried about certain things and um, in the earlier uh, slide, I wanted to point out that uh, while the uh, uh, Dracula, while the vampire is draining uh, the blood of the English and turning them into something else, it is also giving them new racial identity and eliminating the English. So, this is a loss, the English and the loss of uh, English identity is a loss uh, which is uh, greatly uh, worried about which is uh, which is producing a lot of anxiety uh, in this particular work too. So, that is that is something we need to keep in mind. Now, late Victorian imperial gothic is worried about a couple of things. It is worried about regression, individual regression or going native. Um, so, they are worried that you know the English people, the British people are moving backwards in time and um, it, it was also worried about an invasion of civilization by the forces of barbarism or demonism. So, uh, for example, the Dracula is seen as a, a barbaric or a demonic attack on um, the principles of civilization held dear by the British public. So, uh, that is also part of this uh, imperial gothic and further the diminution of opportunities for adventure and heroism in the modern world. So, they also saw the imperial gothic as, a, uh, as a offering a window into the lack of opportunities for uh, adventure and heroic um, pursuits in this uh, modern uh, society. So, these are some of the ideas that Patrick uh, Brantlinger 
uh, uh, wrote about in the rule of darkness, British literature and imperialism. It's a, uh, it's a great work that um, you can check it out if you want to know more about imperial Gothic. Now, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness, which is published in 1902, also talks about uh, the idea of degeneration, the go lack of um, civilizational principles among the English people. And um, this particular novel is a classic novel that attacks European greed and rapacity, um, the uh, exploitation and cruelty of the English people uh, that were inflicted on a uh, colonial uh, public. And uh, in this novel, uh, novel, we saw Africa as being extremely mysterious. Africa is also associated with savage uh, qualities. And again, um, spiritual mystery is also uh, uh, tacked on to all these uh, set of ideas. So um, what this particular novel does essentially is uh, talk about the contradictions that underlie the colonial project, the colonial project of civilizing uh, the, imp uh, the imperial countries and the countries that were brought under imperialism by um, uh, uh, powerful forces such as Great Britain. So this novel tells us, yes, um, you know, these colonial public and spaces are mysterious and, and full of mystery and, and dangerous and, and its people are savage. That's there, but um, the colonial administrators, the adventurers are also savage and also greedy. So how do we reconcile these two things? So that kind of contradiction is uh, brought forth in works such as um, The Heart of Darkness and it's also referred to in uh, Wilkie Collins' uh, Moonstone. So these two works are interesting in this particular uh, regard. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.